kick starts off, I think, just as we're a couple of minutes uh, after half past. So a very warm welcome, everyone, to this Civic University Network uh, webinar, Lights, Camera, Civic, where we're going to explore civic practice through two case studies of creative industries networks, the South Yorkshire Filmmakers Network and the South Yorkshire Cultural and Creative Industries Network. My name is Debbie Squire. I'm the Head of Place and Civic Engagement at Sheffield Hallam University, which is the home of the Civic University Network. Uh, before we begin, just a brief bit of webinar housekeeping. The session is being recorded and will be made available after the event through the Civic University Network website. Our cameras and microphones will remain switched off during the session. Uh, if you have a question for a speaker, please post it in the Q&A function and we will answer as many questions as we can. Uh, please do also use the chat function for any general comments uh, as we go. And if you're on Twitter, you can engage with us at, at Civic University. Uh, the team here will be dropping some links into the chat as we go. At Sheffield Hallam University, we're very proud of our civic impact in our place and proud to run the Civic University Network, which aims to spread good civic practice and in particular to support universities across the UK to maximise their civic impact in their place. Today's session is the third in a series of webinars of case studies which were featured in the Cultural Partnerships Transforming Lives in-person event, which was held in December last year. The case studies will give insight into two successful, well-established creative industries networks and will allow us to explore the different roles universities can or could play in transformative cultural partnerships. Oh, I think we've got the wrong slide up on screen there. We can alter that. Um, we'll first hear from Rob Speranza, Director of the South Yorkshire Filmmakers Network, and then from Ian Wilde, Chief Executive of the Showroom Workstation, who will talk about the South Yorkshire Cultural and Creative Industries Network. We'll have some time for questions at the end of the presentations, uh, but without any further ado, it's my great pleasure to hand over to Rob Speranza, Director of the South Yorkshire Filmmakers Network. Hello, thank you very much. That was a nice intro. So, um, hello everybody, and um, I hope you can see me. You can see me, right? Yes, I hope you can. Um, I have just, let me just share this a little bit better. So, I'm gonna have a little chat with you guys today. Um, about how we as a company have engaged with higher education since really like the dawn of time in my business's sense. Um, so yeah, about 19 years we've been around um, as the South Yorkshire Filmmakers Network. So my name is Rob Sparanz. I'm then the founder and director of that. And I'm a filmmaker myself too, a line producer and producer. Um, and oh yeah, I gotta apologize. My voice is a little bit on the scratchy side right now. It's uh, it's taken a bit of a battering over the last few days with um with DocFest, Sheffield DocFest in town, and lots and lots of networking and talking and sometimes yelling over loud music and stuff. So uh, yeah, so apologies for that. I hope you can hear me fine. Um, what I'm gonna do in this talk is just like, kind of outline positives and negatives, positives and negatives, and give you a few examples of what I felt worked and what didn't over the years. A Little bit of insight uh, about how we've worked with, with universities and colleges. And I wanna do it from both the point of view of our members, as in people that, our actual members of the network uh, itself, and also my uh, point of view um, as the person that's led the you know relationship with the company's you know director. So I hope that that sounds cool. So just a little bit about who we are first. Again, we're called the South Yorkshire Filmmakers Network, and we are the largest uh, filmmakers network network for filmmakers outside of London now, uh, with over I think about fifty eight hundred people on our social media, for example, about two thousand involved from a membership point of view. Um, we started back in 2004 as uh, just the Sheffield Filmmakers Network. That didn't last very long uh, to expand to South Yorkshire. We wanted to call it something even bigger than that, like the Northern Filmmakers Network or Yorkshire, but there already were businesses that were called that, although they weren't doing very much. And uh, so we stayed with South Yorkshire. And I'll tell you what, it, it, that's worked. Even though I've wanted to change the name over the years, um, I've just kind of kept that branded. And um, so, yeah, but despite the name, we, we cover a much larger area than just South Yorkshire. And we run networking events like something called Shooters in the Pub, which happens on the first Wednesday of the month. That's just people getting together, literally in a bar and talking about projects. Screenings like Showroom Shorts uh, at the Showroom Cinema. We've got the director of that organization, Ian Wilde here, is talking after me today and has helped me put that together over the years, screening for short films on the third Tuesday of the month. And then training initiatives like our directions workshops and competitions like the two weeks to make it music video competition. We do a fair amount of stuff, you know, face to face. 
And we, we, we like to regularly work with partners like the BFI and Screen Yorkshire and an organization in, in Sheffield called The Curious, of course, the showroom itself, uh, DocFest that just uh, is ending today, and lots of other partners, other festivals too, to deliver the above and more things too. So as I say, we got about 5,800 people on Facebook, about 3,000 on Twitter, a little more, about a um, little somewhere between 1,900 and 2,000 on a mailing list, and about 700 on Instagram. That's our newest platform we've just really launched for ourselves. We haven't really delved into Instagram yet. So I'm going to do it like this, where we've got like a couple of different engagements. I've got like three, okay, different ones here of ways that we've engaged with HE, with higher education over the years. And, um, you know, with a few photos of, of some actual events that we've done this at. So the first one is just networking itself, which makes sense because that's what we're, you know, we are primarily a networking organization as well as a production company, as well as a, you know, events organization. We are really about networking. And so, of course, students regularly come to our networking events and they seek collaboration and opportunities when they come to these sorts of things. This is a, a still from uh, Shooters in the Pub that you're looking at here. It's not really in a pub, this one. This is in a, actually at the Curious, I mentioned before, but normally it's in a more like, you know, kind of social pubby type environment, bar type environment. And these students that come to the events are usually people that are seeking work experiences or trying to, you know, get in there with local production companies maybe at least try to get an interview or like try to get like a little bit more uh, familiar with people uh, and just make connections with the wider industry. There are a lot of different people that come to shooters in the pub. There's everything from, you know, your overall average uh, filmmakers to more specific people like actors and uh, writers and maybe composers and people like that. So there's lots of ways for students to engage with these people. Um, we also have, because the, the student take up has been pretty good over uh, the, the history of the, of the event, uh, we have a student membership price, it's 20 pound a year versus the 30 pound a year full price. Those are about to go up, unfortunately, soon because this, you know, cost of living crisis is filtering down to us now, too. And um, and just to kind of make it like just to kind of update it from now, 2023, uh, regular people, regular cohorts, like groups of, say, between 10 and maybe about maximum about 25 cohorts from the master's degree course at Hallam University have started to come to shoot shoes in the pub via a tutor at Sheffield Hallam University called uh, Colin Pons. He also is a producer and is co-director of the SYFN. So here are, as I said, I would do the positives and negatives. Rob, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, being your slides, I'm not sure if you're thinking you are sharing. I am uh, sharing, am I not? No, it's not on screen, Rob. I just Should thought be. That's really not good, is it? Because I've been talking about it, I'm looking at pictures. You see it now? We can see it now, yeah, that's great. I think maybe like between that, when we were sharing that, um, that you know, opening slide, it just stopped or whatever. Yeah. It All right, whatever. Okay, that's what this looked like before, people. <laughs> if you want pictures of, yeah, people having a beer. All right, He's, okay, we're good now, right? You just wanna to turn to um, slide view. We're on preview. Cool, great. Brilliant, thanks. All right, nice. So yeah, some positives and negatives of networking with students and how that's built, like how it's affected us. So of course, a really obvious positive is that the network membership grows. We get more people, get more members, you know, whether in the shape of students or not. And these are better opportunities for young filmmakers to begin to engage with more professionals. Of course, you know, it's a huge positive for them and, and you know, hopefully and thankfully, you know, for the professionals too. Uh, it also, you know, is, is great to get more uh, higher education institutions and colleges, universities, et cetera, to just be aware that the SYFN exists, you know, that we're an organization that uh, that people might want to engage more with and, and, and be quite creative with the ways that they work with us and find out about the flexibility and, you know, the, the, the sort of, um, I don't know, the, yeah, flexibility that we've got as an organization. And of course, for some specific students, this could lead from a placement to a job. So I just had an example of this just happened uh, this month and last month, a young, a young student, second year student at university, local university called Caitlin Taylor. She, she um, you know, applied first just as a work experience kind of person. She just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, doing some help in the office, maybe helping me with some events. And I really liked her and I thought she was really switched on. And so as a result, I offered her some paid work pretty much straight away as a production coordinator because I needed one on a, on a film I just shot. Uh, about three weeks ago, a little less than three weeks ago. And she helped me right through May and June in this office. 
you know, helping me with, with, um, uh, you know, production management type stuff, coordination, helping with, with, um, uh, people's whereabouts and parking and accommodation and just practical stuff like that. She was really good. So she didn't come to the organization with that intention. You know, she only was there thinking about like a bit of networking and a bit of, you know, work experience, maybe, but it led to a job straight away. So if, if the person's really good, you know, that can happen. Um, and then just as an observation of a, of a positive thing, oftentimes the students that do come to the networking events, just as an example, are, are the ones who make it. They're the ones that are a little bit more bothered. They're the ones that, that actually, when they make that effort, they get there. They, you find out a few years later or even sooner than that, that they're really moving into the industry and, and navigating through. Um, so, okay, some negatives. I'll try to go faster through the negatives. <laughs> Sometimes like some students don't really know how to network. You know, um, and I do a separate talk about like effective networking, to be honest, but I mean, we won't get into that now, but it's often true that like some of these students come and, you know, they really don't know what they're doing. And, and even if they, you know, and if they're really awkward about it or they kind of just, you know, think they had to talk all the time and dominate the conversation, it can get a little awkward for them. So sometimes I try to help people a little bit to navigate their way through a networking event. And sometimes you get some people that just come for freebies, like a free drink when I offer that. Uh, and exploit whatever they can to get the free drink and then they're out, you know, or they take something um, like if I'm giving away posters or something, you know, and they just kind of get those and leave and not talk to anyone. That's not really what you do at a networking event. Uh, and sometimes they sign up for like, say, like what I mentioned before, the little cohorts that are coming from uh, an MA class. And then they don't actually come, you know, they sign up for it, but they don't come. And that's a shame because, you know, the university is funding these things and putting resources behind them. So you don't want that. And then sometimes you also get one or two people that might come and they just want to like, like own you. They, they just kind of jump all over you and they might plague members of the network or even myself with requests. There was somebody that was like begging me to let him film at one of the networking events that we did a few months ago. And I was like, you can film a little bit. Oh, I want to interview people there. And then I want to do a presentation. And then I want to do this. I'm like, everything that you're talking about is going to take like two hours, you know, and the whole event is only two and a half. So that's probably not a good idea, you know? So, okay. Second engagement now is when we have screenings and we showcase student work. So that's prim primarily at uh, Showroom Shorts, I mentioned before. So you get students from Northern universities and local colleges, et cetera, to regularly submit to the, uh, to the SYFN, to me, really, to get their work screened at Showroom Shorts or sometimes other events I do that are similar to that. Um, and of course, this gives students a local uh, public accessible platform which is free as well for people to see and attend to aspire to when creating their work they think about a local benchmark rather than saying oh i want to try to get this into leeds festival or aesthetica or you know a bigger bafta or oscar nominated festival shortlisted festival it might be a little easier to think about you know a sort of local platform where if you've got a strong piece a decent piece you know it might be a little easier to get and also as a result of of the uh, sheer uh, amount of films I get sometimes I've dedicated whole screenings to student work like I did one which is just about animated films that came out of Hallam University or master's degree films that came out of uh, Chef Hallam and just recently I had a whole spate of films that came from Sheffield colleges across the city and I'll talk more about that in a moment so positives and negatives about this engagement um, the positives uh, which are pretty obvious is that again there's opportunities for people to network and suggest collaboration with other filmmakers, you know, both new filmmakers and old filmmakers at screenings. Um, so, you know, we, we usually dedicate a nice little portion of the screening, you know, before and in the middle and after for pure networking for people to meet each other after they've seen each other's work. Um, students learn about the festival submission process as well and how to submit a film to a professional programming body. It is amazing how sometimes to me, people don't really understand how to get their films to people or like, you know, that they should show up at these events or that they should, you know, how to submit when I ask them for the materials, a, a, a file that isn't massive, like isn't a ProRes raw file that's like 10 gig for a two minute film or something like that. You know, and I need a still. What does a still mean, Rob? What do you mean by that? I need a good summary. What summary? And they send me like two paragraphs. I'm like, no, no, no. I just need like a little, you know, two lines. So it's that kind of stuff to like to teach them and learn about what it'd be like to submit to festivals. And yeah, and then when they attend, they are a little bit more savvy with when they come out of these things about how to attend creative arts events, film festivals, that kind of thing outside of like, say, university centric or 
in insular events that happen at universities or colleges where they attend. And some negatives on this, sometimes we get too many. Like for example, I mentioned, I was gonna say this again, uh, more later, this is later. The Sheffield Colleges this year, I had like this weird unofficial thing that happened where I got this massive wave of, stu of, of films from, from college students. And I had no idea this was going on, but a bunch of tutors all decided to mention showroom shorts to their, to their students. And, oh, we want you to send it to them, send it to them, send it to them. And suddenly I was getting like, you know, this, this buffet of email, um, you know, of tons of, of college students' films. And I was like, where, where are these all coming from? I can't do these all at the same time. So instead of like, you know, doing it in that unofficial way, I've suggested to them, why don't we do something, man, we, will, we, we even showcase some of the best of, you know, the chef of college film students work in the future instead of them just coming randomly. And I think they're up for that. They want to talk about that uh, for next year. Another negative is, of course, part of the industry is being rejected. Not if you don't get your film accepted, that doesn't mean it's the end of the world and you can't survive and, you know, you can't ever make a film again. But rejection is part of the process and having to talk to students about that and get them to understand that that's, you know, that's a natural thing. You might not get screened. It's not a guarantee that if you send it to us, it's going to get screened. So we got to talk to them about that sometimes. You can't screen everything. And then, yes, yeah, sometimes like, you know, some quality of, of, of some films hand in hand with this are glaringly different from other work in the program. And yeah, there are ways, of course, to talk about that and mitigate that. Okay, hope you're still with me. Um, third engagement here are the talks and programs that we do, which is more about, you know, training. So students often come to our uh, master classes and workshops. They're called directions, like a subheading brand. Though the student tennis, these I think could be better, a little bit more robust. And universities and colleges often draw on my own academic background. I've got an MA and a PhD. And a lot, and about 25 years teaching myself in, in colleges or, or well universities. And to deliver talks and programs at the university, I often come to them and do a talk, maybe a one-off, sometimes even like run a program or run a module. I've done that before. And I've done that at all the universities you see here uh, on the screen here uh, over the years. Um, and uh, one of the things I also did that really stands out for me is uh, I worked with um, at Chef Allen University to deliver, co-deliver, a program called Mental Health in Film and Television uh, in 2018. And that was really all about how students that, that would say they have, they, they um, say they have a mental health uh, issue. How do they get their way through the industry? How can they cope with that and still, you know, get involved with the film and television industry? And then we had a series of talks for about three days and visits to different sites and institutions, film organizations and production companies over the three days to kind of, you know, let them see how they could do this. We have like the ex-head of mental health, the BBC, for example, do a talk for us. Um, yeah, and then another one which is related to this is when I do a bit of work with either the BFI Film Academy, uh, which is a program of training for young uh, filmmakers. Uh, I think it's 15 to 19. And then the uh, BFI Young Filmmaker Challenges, which are uh, make fil young filmmakers under 25 to make films that are uh, on, on a certain theme under three minutes long. So the positives and negatives on these, uh, the positives are of course that students of course get to work with the professional filmmakers actively making films, I mean that in myself. And uh, students get to hear and learn about firsthand experience within the industry as a result of that. Um, if they are on a course, say as an example, I, I draw a lot to Sheffield Island University on this, um, a course that they used to run called professional practice that can enhance their degree offer about actually engaging with the professional uh, sector and industry uh, as a result of being on that course. And it further develops students' ambitions and clarity on roles that they might wanna fill in the future. Like if nobody knows what a gaffer is or a grip, well, they'll certainly learn after being involved with something to do uh, with me and the film industry. So only a couple negatives here, but you know, sometimes when it comes to the talks and programs, students sometimes don't engage with the guest speaker talks as much as they should when it comes to some of the training. And I think it is getting better uh, recently, but that could be better still. Uh, sometimes to get more students coming to these events, it's really down to marketing. And that really is pretty much across the board with all three of these engagements. But I will say that the marketing is probably the strongest thing to try and get more people. That's the thing that might need the most help to get more students uh, to these things, to these events. And sometimes when it comes to getting paid and seeing money come through from the university to my organization for doing these things in the future uh, at all, you know, sometimes that red tape can take a long time to get registered. I, I've taken it's taken as long as nine, 10 months sometimes to see just a little bit of money, like 200 pounds or something, you know, come from the university to subsidize something that I ran 
you know, through one of these training events can take a long time. And I think that needs a lot of help. So how has this affected uh, us as a business? I'm going to finish in about two, three minutes, by the way, how we affected, how we've been affected by this engagement. Well, as I kind of mentioned a little bit before, but even more robustly, working with universities and colleges has helped us as a network expand in terms of, of course, membership numbers, but also reputation, awareness, like I mentioned before, potential for collaboration with more university and college bodies, HE bodies. This has led, as I said, a little bit to offers of jobs and work. You know, I was a course leader for different workshops and courses at Leeds Beckett University, Darby University, University of Sheffield, and that's led to that in some ways. Um, a better relationship with the BFI and programming work with them has helped as a result of working with some of the students that, that you know, that, that came through their programs. And we've got more student members that rely on the SYFN to help them make that jump, to help them shepherd them from university life, student life and work to professional work in the city so they can see the SYFN as a nice, you know, jumping off point in a place. Um, but I think this could have more enhancement and development. There's a few different incubators that have been put in place in the future, but in the past rather. But I'd like to see that kind of thing be enhanced a little bit more. And of course, a little bit more income for the business, for my business, and also as a freelancer from fees to run the courses like the mental health course and the talks, but I think sometimes it's a little bit too low. So in conclusion, what, what does this relationship need? What do I think it could be points of contention we could talk about um, when it comes to you know, dealing with uh, these relationships? Probably a little bit more funding sometimes if I use that mental health and film and TV uh, as, a, as a barometer. You know, I think we were firefighting a little bit to try to get a little bit more funding behind that. And that has happened before. Um, sometimes I feel that there could be better routes, better communication, better, like, like narrower communication between the institution and our business. And like, so we don't have to talk to so many people and they don't have to answer to people that have first strings or they can't make decisions themselves. So more autonomy from the people at the institution when they deal with us for the relationship to continue beyond the course and develop in a healthy way. The issue of trust. Sometimes it feels that some of the older school teachers and course leaders might hesitate to engage with a business or the professional sector because they might be afraid that we're going to like give the students that do get involved with this a bit of a, like too much of a one up or too much of, a, of an asset. Whereas other people that didn't uh, engage with us, you know, like maybe lag behind. And if it's an issue of money, like the 20 pound membership fee, for example, that could be a blockade for them. And then I think, you know, there could be a possible workflow or development platform for students to transition from students to professional states, maybe like some kind of incubator for the people that might want to create a business here. And that's been something that has existed in the, in, in the past in Sheffield. But I'd like to see more things like that that are be better publicized and well known. And as I said, I think there should be less red tape and sometimes, you know, bureaucracy, sorry, but yes, to wade through to get paid and get registered with, a, with an HE body and contingent engagement. So yeah, it's been good to talk about this and I'll stop uh, sharing now, but uh, it's been good. I'd like to see if you guys have any questions. Here we are. Thank you so much, Rob. That was a really brilliant run through um, years of, of uh, experience there. You've got uh, linking with HE institutions across, across the country, particularly in the North. You can't really underestimate, I think, the impact of uh, on employability of that professional practice experience. So uh, it's fantastic to hear about all the work on the on the various different fronts. Um, if anyone does have any questions either now or as we progress, please do drop them in the in the Q and A. Um, I had a quick question about a point you made around um, Sheffield College. So that was interesting when you said you had too many applications because lots of people had spontaneously been talking um, <laughs> about how to submit entries uh, at the same time and sort of independently of each other. Just yeah. interested in your thoughts on whether you would do something about that in future, because you mentioned rejection as being part of the overall normal process. Is that something you would want to approach differently by coordinating that, or do you think just leave it as it is, and if it happens again, it's part of that natural process? No, it's 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 a good question, uh, Debbie. I mean, I, I already have done something about it because <laughs> I was just getting, you know, like like a bit of inexplicable waves of students' uh, films, and I and I thought, why am I getting so many of these from 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 students at once? And some people had the wrong end of the stick, for example, thinking that we were like an online festival, and some people thought that we were like a film festival that happened once, you know, that kind of thing. I'm like, no, we're a monthly screening. What, who's doing this? I need to speak to someone in charge and find out what they're telling people. You know, telling the students. So I, I found out who was um, 
in charge of this, but from a colleague that I had at the university at the college. And he told me, oh yeah, you need to speak to so-and-so. And I didn't know who she was. So when I spoke to her and I found out that that had been spread through like maybe two or three different tutors that worked on a you know film and media degree, uh, film media course, I should say, at the college. Um, I had a chat with her about it and I said like, we could probably coordinate this better rather than just kind of spreading the films throughout time, you know, and seeing when they would screen. And also they were the, under the impression that we were having more screenings through July and August. We don't, we don't do them in the summer, for example, like the one that happens actually tomorrow is the last one for, uh, for the summer until September. So, oh, we didn't know that. Oh, we didn't. I was like, well, you know, let's have a chat about these things in, in, in the future so that when you do spread the word to your students, you know, then, you know, they can also, they can, they can help with this. I think one of the students also was, under the impression that um, that if they submitted to us, we'd guarantee accepting it. And that would be part of her grade. And I'm like, I don't want to influence someone's grade. No, we can't, no, you know. So all of that has been since agreed upon and coordinated. She's a lot more like uh, amenable to how this would be. And I think we might even do something next year where like the, you know, we actually showcase films from Sheffield College, say for maybe half of one of my programs, maybe 35 or 40 minutes of, student films uh so yeah that's a little bit more streamlined now that's great thank you so much rob um what i'll do now is i think we'll in and then we'll come back together for uh, a, a discussion between you and ian together at, at the end of the session um, and yeah. there are a couple more questions and i think i'd like to pick up on some of the things you had in your last slide but we can uh we can do that at the end of the session with ian so for now though thank you so much rob um yeah. really appreciate your uh, your your presentation today um, and we're going to now move to Ian Wilde who's going to talk to us about the South Yorkshire Cultural and Creative Industries Network so Ian if you can pop your camera um, and microphone back on and Rob if you wouldn't mind switching yours off that's yeah. perfect transition okay that's great. over to you then Ian right okay well, let me share my screen um, first of all Does that look okay? Yeah, I think if you just put it on presentation view, we yes. can see them. That's great. There you go. Right. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about the South Yorkshire Culture and Creative Industries Network, S-Y-C-C-I-N, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and I suppose the first lesson is to think about the name before you start something. Um, but I wanted to talk about what it is, what it actually does, some of uh, our successes, some of the challenges, and maybe then go on to talk about uh, what I hope will be the next steps. Um, it's a new network. So unlike um, Rob's network, uh, who's been going for a long time, we were starting from scratch. Um, so let me just introduce myself. My name's Ian Wild. I'm the chief executive of the showroom and workstation in Sheffield. For anyone who doesn't know us, we are a, an independent cinema with four screens. We show a very broad range of independent films, foreign language films, documentaries, archive films. Uh, we have many festivals, seasoned events throughout the year. Uh, as Rob said, we have a program short film exhibition and we've been working with him for a long time on that. Uh, and actually, today is the final day of Sheffield Doc Fest, um, which is a big international festival. Uh, and we're really pleased that uh, attendance has grown quite significantly this year. So it does seem to be bouncing back from COVID. Um, and as well as the show, we also operate the workstation, which is a creative industries managed workspace center. We have about 60 creative industries working in our building. Uh, we have a cafe bar. We have uh, lots of conferencing activity going on. And we are one of the two partners in Film Hub North, um, which provides support for film exhibition across Northern England. And we fund early career development and short film production. So uh, there's quite a lot of activity going on and a lot of the stuff we do 
uh, does tend to be networking. And in talking about the, uh, the South Yorkshire network, we have kind of drawn on our experience of, of doing lots of events over many years. So, um, so let's start with what it is. Um, I suppose with the establishment of the South Yorkshire Combined Mayor Authority, formerly Sheffield City Region, as a, a new regional body, and it became clear quite quickly that the creative industries, creative industry sector was not particularly well networked across our region. There was lots of um, networked in individual towns and cities in Sheffield. Certainly there's lots of networking going on. But uh, I remember going to a meeting, um, I think it was in Barnsley that had been organised by the previous mayor, Dan Jarvis, who um, he'd invited lots of people from Rotherham, Barnsley, Doncaster, Sheffield to a meeting to talk about uh, how we could work together. And it was very clear that um, outside indiv individual cities, very few people knew each other. Um, and it struck me at the time that, um, you know, if we were going to be a, a successful region, we needed to improve on that. So after the lockdown, I started to talk to um, Kate Brindley, who had been appointed by the mayor's office to support the development of the creative sector in South Yorkshire. And in 2021, this was, we decided to help and develop some networking events across the region to try and improve connectivity. And we very much wanted these to be physical meetings rather than online. I think at that time, just post COVID, we were uh, quite fed up with Zoom meetings and uh, really wanted to meet some real people or some people in real life. Um, so we gave ourselves a couple of objectives. We wanted to improve connectivity in the region. And the other thing we wanted to do was to try and celebrate our successes. Uh, I think we felt that in South Yorkshire, we didn't celebrate uh, our successes as much as other places we were aware of. And, uh, and so it felt right that we should talk about um, trying to tell people about what we were doing. Um, so we decided to launch the network with a big meeting, a big gathering, um, which became the Creative Summit, which took place in September 2021. Um, this was the launch of the network, but it's also partly a celebration of the release of the film version of Everybody's Talking About Jamie. Um, you may be aware that uh, Jamie had started life as a, a stage play, a musical at Sheffield Theatres. It had transferred to the West End, to the country. It had just opened in Broadway, in New York, I think. And it had been made into a film by um, Warp Films, who were a Sheffield-based production company, you know, funded by Fox, and then I think uh, Amazon Prime were involved. Uh, so that seemed like a great success story for us. So we, we timed the start of the summit to coincide with the release of that film. Um, we invited lots of people to speak. We had representatives from the Arts Council. Uh, Darren Henley was there. The BFI uh, was Ben Luxford. Uh, uh, Creative England, we had Caroline Norbury speaking. And we had lots of local uh, people talking about local case studies, about what was going on in South Yorkshire. Um, and then that was followed by the premiere of, of the film at Sheffield Theatres. Um, and at the end, we, we felt that it had been a great success. We you know, had some direct evidence of, of people meeting each other for the first time and starting to talk about doing things together, you know, particularly meetings between Warp Films and the Mayor's Office, um, which may well lead to investment at some point. So it, it did feel like we'd started really well. Um, so after that, we started to put together a partnership. Um, we developed plans to have meetings across the region. We secured some funding from the mayor's office to support us. Um, and we we're very clear that we wanted 
the network to be open to uh, everyone. It, we, we're trying to avoid barriers. And so we were very clear that it had to be free uh, and anybody could come along who, who had an interest. Um, we started to organize meetings across the region. We invited lots of creatives. Um, we tried to build connections wherever we could. We met in different towns and cities um, and different venues. Um, and we kind of did set up a what became our normal format, which was to invite a, a keynote speaker or have a panel of speakers, followed by some discussion um, and followed by some food and drink, uh, which very quickly evolved into beer and pizza, which seemed to be a very popular format. Um, but the purpose of that was to encourage people to stay afterwards and to sort of talk to each other. Um, and as we progressed, that started to happen more and more. Um, we also encouraged people to um, suggest things that they wanted to talk about. And we had quite a few people approaching us asking if they could present on a certain subject or to tell us about the project they were working on. And we also, at the end of every meeting, had a, a slot uh, which was open for anybody to stand up and do a pitch. Uh, we started th saying a three minute pitch. Sometimes it's a bit longer than that, but sometimes a bit shorter. But uh, again, as we progressed, um, more and more people wanted to come along and tell us about something they were doing. Um, we set ourselves a target initially of about 50 people per meeting. And that was a fairly arbitrary target, um, but it seemed like a good number to aim for. And for the first few meetings, we didn't achieve that. We were, uh, I think the first meeting had about 30 people there. But again, as, as things progressed, as the network developed, um, we got more and more people coming. And towards the end, we were exceeding 50 by quite a long way. Um, so um, it felt like it was working very well. Um, the other thing that changed were the themes. So um, when we started, we were looking at sort of more sectoral topics. We, we talked about films, we talked about games, we had one on young creatives. But we started to get feedback from participants saying they wanted something a bit more general. You know, if they were working in games, they didn't really want to come and uh, Talk to an event about, I don't know, visual arts or something. And so the themes we started to use were uh, more general storytelling, audiences, festivals were, were some of the topics we talked about. Um, generally, um, we started about six o'clock, a two hour session. Quite often uh, they were longer as people stayed and, and wanted to talk to each other after the meeting. Um, we also um, started to engage some uh, independent curators. Um, we, we were conscious at the beginning that um, we wanted to increase numbers. We knew we weren't uh, connecting with everybody we should be. And we set up a steering group to try and uh, help us develop the network. Um, the steering group were very helpful in suggesting topics, in helping to um, spread the word. And um, we, did, we did a couple of other things that really helped us to, to, to be successful. Um, first thing is we appointed someone to work on uh, comms and PR um, on a full-time basis, which was um, incredibly helpful. Um, Kelly Worsley uh, worked incredibly hard and did an amazing job. We produced regular newsletters, did lots of PR, uh, developed a mailing list, we developed a logo. Um, but the other thing that, that really helped was establishing a, a network of ambassadors for the scheme. Um, we, th that helped to sort of give us feedback on, on how things were going. Um, we tried to engage some ambassadors, particularly from the universities, uh, to try and engage with students, to try and encourage more uh, people in academia to come along. 
Uh, and we've managed to get the wonderful Chris Husbands, who's the VC of Sheffield Hallam University, to support us. So we felt the network of ambassadors was really important. Um, in the end, we had uh, eight sessions in total. Uh, in, it was about 300, just over 350 people came um, in, in, with speakers on top of that. Um, the participants came from a, quite a wide variety of different sectors, uh, including television, games, digital design, uh, exhibition, education. Uh, people came from funded cultural organizations uh, and some people from pretty hard edged creative institutions as well, creative industries. Um, we had people from local authorities and um, we started to get more and more people from the universities as uh, as the network progressed. Um, we did some surveys of people who came. It was very noticeable that um, more and more people started to travel. And one of our surveys indicated that 65% of participants were prepared to travel to different cities for events uh, if they were of specific interest. Um, we had over 150 subscribers for our newsletter. It's, I think it's probably quite a lot more than that now. Um, we had 27 ambassadors in our network. And um, we actually had quite a few people, I think, who said they had made connections at meetings that had led to work opportunities. We're very pleased uh, with that. And again, I think that's probably growing. Um, so the, the physical meetings actually came to an end last year, we, most of the activity was in uh, 2022. Um, since then, we've continued to host uh, some webinars. We've had two to date. Um, and we're hoping to organize a larger summit event to conclude the series either later this year or, or early next year. Um, we did ask people why they came along, what was of interest. Um, Kaylee, who uh, worked on PR, did this World Cloud for us, which is really interesting. I think you can see certain, certain words leaping out, networking, region, sector, creatives. Um, but there's a lot of other stuff in there as well. Um, and I think people gave a wide range of reasons for coming to the meetings. Um, and so we had a uh, a, a list of conclusions from, from the, the network. Um, I think from a, a starting point where we're, there was very little interregional connectivity, uh, we now have a much better network in South Yorkshire. It's very clear that people are prepared to move around the region if they believe they will make useful connections. Um, the most active attenders were the ambassadors, as you can imagine, that's why they're ambassadors. Um, and they would have the most overall impact on other people attending. It was really helpful to, for them to use their own networks to share information about what we were doing and basically to share their overall enthusiasm for the project. Um, the people who came, the attendees, said they found the meetings useful in establishing connections, developing business opportunities. There's a desire expressed for more, for a more structured set of meetings. Um, and which is probably correct. We try to be quite flexible in how we organize things. Um, I think this time last year, we at rather late notice added an extra meeting during Sheffield Doc Fest because of the level of interest from participants in knowing more about the festival. And uh, we even persuaded the mayor to come along and speak at that one. So that was um, fairly opportunistic, but it, it really worked. Um, in our survey, we scored quite a high overall level of satisfaction with the meetings, although, of course, this can improve. And we have uh, quite a lengthy list of suggestions about what people would like in future events. Um, there was a suggestion that the events were too corporate and too business focused um, and that people or some people wanted them to be more lighthearted and creative. 
um, funded cultural organisations didn't attend as much as we had expected. Um, we had thought we might struggle to connect with the commercial sector, but that wasn't necessarily the case. And more commercial organisations attended than, than perhaps we, we had expected. And we're very pleased about that. Uh, but it'd be useful to, to do a bit more research in, into what were the barriers or funded organisations from the line. Um, generally, people said they preferred evening events uh, outside of core work times. Although it's worth saying that the final event we held in Rotherham at the Civic Theatre uh, was in the morning and it had very, very good attendance and it was almost difficult to get people to leave, um, but they, they very much enjoyed the networking after the meeting. Um, a, lot, a lot of the participants expressed an interest in building on what had been achieved, and it would be very nice if we could find a way to continue the network. And I suppose finally, uh, one of the most positive outcomes uh, was a desire among participants to bring the sector together uh, and to work on activity collectively that would benefit South Yorkshire as a region. And I think there's a feeling that maybe this is the start of uh, the region being able to bid for some uh, major events um, in South Yorkshire. So, you know, I hope we can find a way to, to continue this network. Um, there's clear interest in developing it. It needs support, it needs funding. It's very time consuming. Um, I mean, I would like to thank very much uh, Kaylee Worsley and Kate Brindley, who I worked with on this, and I, it couldn't have happened without their incredible support. Um, I've got a few pictures of uh, things we did. I mean, it's a bit blurry, but that was the, the creative summit we started with. Um, we had a, a meeting that was in uh, the Civic Theatre, I think, in uh, Barnsley. Um, that's, um, various places. That's the mayor attending the final event in Sheffield. So thanks everybody. Uh, if you've got any questions, I'd be happy to, to try and uh, answer them now. I want to share my screen. Thanks ever so much, Ian. So it, it feels like there was a, a, a real appetite for that sort of collaboration across the sector. And from what you said then, did you did you get lots of freelancers and you talked about the funded organizations perhaps not being so well attended? I was just interested in, in, in sort of your engagement with uh, the sort of wider, maybe the smaller organization or individual level of the sector. Yeah, I mean, lots of people just turned up, with, you know, un unexpectedly that they found out about it and came along. Um, I think we'd expected some of the um, you know, theatres and galleries and place people like that to come along and, and maybe because of the topics it didn't engage with them as fully as we, we'd hoped. So in developing something going forward I think it might be worth putting a bit of thought in, into what type of topics would engage um, some of those people. Um, but, but lots of people kept started coming to meetings um, anyway so it was noticeable towards the end um, you know the same people were coming because they they were making connections and they were enjoying it regardless of who was speaking. They were coming to for the networking element. Um, and that really grew in importance. So it was almost like people came for the networking. They weren't overly bothered about who the speaker was. I mean, that was a factor, but but they wanted to, to take the opportunity to meet new people. Yeah, that's great. Just one last quick question for me before we bring Rob back in. Then we have a couple of questions in the chat you mentioned about getting engaged with Hallam with with Chris Husbands and um, I guess you're at sort of a much earlier development stage in terms of your network compared to uh, Rob's experience what do you think would be a good way forward in terms of engagement with Hallam or with with other universities or indeed the FE colleges within our sort of region well we found by specifically trying to recruit ambassadors from um, both Sheffield universities and that, that was really helpful in, in trying to spread the word and to engaging with students and to uh, you know, engaging with other people's networks. Uh, so in terms of going forward, it'd be good to sort of uh, develop the, those university contacts and to, to bring in more people who uh, wanted to contribute to the network, to suggest themes and to, to 
to suggest speakers, uh, but also to engage with a sort of broader student um, uh, body and particularly, you know, people who were interested in uh, setting up a creative interest themselves or, or, or trying to find work within the, the creative sector. Uh, all that would, would help in, in terms of planning for future meetings. Yeah. That's great. Thank you, Ian. Um, if we can just bring Rob back onto the screen then. Hey, Rob. That is great. Thank you. Um, we've had a couple of questions in the chat. I can see there's been a, a little bit of response going on there. But if we could um, think about this for both of you, I'll take the question from uh, Matthew Sanson first. So are there overlaps, conflicts and synergies between the two organisations? I assume it means an organisation, the Euro Network and the, uh, and, and the HE. Um, organization so if so what are they and how can they be managed and uh Rob perhaps you want to go first on that one yeah sure I mean I, I think he's I think Matthew is, is saying like you know synergies between the SYCCIN and SYFN and, and absolutely I was yeah. uh, Ian mentioned um that there were a bunch of ambassadors for the SYCCI and I was, I was one of those as well which was really helpful to to start to see that there might be some dovetailing you know between what my activity you know, could be involved with and what, you know, what SYCCIN more involved with. I think, you know, just after running events for a few years and like seeing, you know, how you engage with people and whatnot, I, it helped to inform, you know, how some of the events were, were going and how they were marketed and stuff, just little bits here and there, which is, I guess, why they involved me a little bit. And also because, you know, I'm involved in, in creative industries. So that kind of thing really, I think, worked. Um, the only time that I don't think I think also what was great is to avoid uh, dates like conflicting dates, you know, so if I'm having an event physical event in Sheffield and they're having, you know, an event where, you know, 20 of my members might presumably attend and then we accidentally, you know, schedule it for the same time in South Yorkshire. That's a bit of a disaster, you know, so we try, we were very good in, in communicating with each other where we didn't step on each other's toes, you know, Ian, you knew anyway. Uh, when most of like when half of my events would happen showroom shorts because it happens at your very venue at the showroom you know so it was a good way to avoid um you know stepping on each other's toes and overlapping dates and stuff so that, i think that's really really important um you know to communicate that way yeah thanks yeah. Mm -hmm. no i would just say you know as part of um the activity we already do at the workstation in the showroom we we do lots of networking activity anyway tends to be Sheffield focus. Um, so we, we're quite experienced in, in organizing events like this. We, we also try and take advantage of things that happen. So if someone produces a new film, we try and get a premiere and invite lots of people from the film sector along. Um, we try and encourage them to hang around, you know, sort of uh, have a drink in the bar afterwards. So um, we try to use that experience to sort of develop the network across the region, not just, not just in Sheffield. And you know, we we Rob said we work quite closely together in to about on the film short film that we do, and we work with other people on uh, local production companies to to do events. Um, we work with lots of festivals that obviously involves networking. So you know, this week we've had the documentary festival with you know, thousands of delegates coming to Sheffield, which is a non-stop networking, and again trying to develop those connections whilst people are in, in Sheffield is quite important. And we're very conscious and aware of the business opportunities that arise when, when you know, you have people coming from, well, not just London, but internationally to, to the city and to try and make sure that we try and take maximum advantage uh, of, those, of those moments um, when people are in town. So, um, yeah, we, we, we try to work with as many people as we can to, terms of developing the network and to sort of uh, um, in encourage them to get involved, I suppose. Um, but but again, it was a challenge because it was not just in Sheffield where we know lots of people, it was me making new connections. And, you know, I don't necessarily know lots of people in Rotherham, Barnsley, Doncaster. And so we're having to engage people who did have those connections and make, try to bring those, those people into into the sort of planning process and talk to them about what would work in, in different towns and cities across the region. And just to extend from that then, is there scope to think about collaborating or working together on widening the HE engagement aspect where you potentially could be looking at 
the same students who might be interested in participating in both the networks in the different formats that have been described are you you joined up on on that approach or could that be something that that would would be helpful yeah i think that could be something that we talk about a bit more about if there was a, more of a focus on how we involve uh you know young people students and just he in general you know uh across both networks that's something i don't think that we've talked about very much no no i think that's right and and i think um you know i think we we do well to think about how we could engage students in 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 these networks in, in much better ways and make i mean you know i suppose we should ask ourselves are, there, are we putting barriers up to st stopping people coming yeah or, because i think you probably are um so it'd be good to maybe um work, work with people from he establishments uh in future planning i mean we and consciously did that in, in terms of setting up the steering group and the ambassadors and try to bring in people from the university to try and think about what would work for a broad range of uh, engagement. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes these things are quite organic though, aren't they? And if you'd stopped and worked all of that out in advance, you'd never move things forward, I guess. But um, I, I liked what you said, uh, Rob, about the workforce development platform, which was that, you know, that linking and working with the way universities are enhancing employability and, and sector skills experiences, um, you know, linking through FE colleges and, and, and that sort of pipeline of, of workforce. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about your thinking there as to what we perhaps aren't doing now and what we could do. I mean, the, uh, the idea of, oh yes, workflow development platform, right. Um, something that was done, uh, I think it was just before COVID kind of thing. You know, Ian, you might know better than me. Remember there was this, this um, incubator that I think Colin Pons, who I mentioned before, was uh, instrumental in starting. And it was an incubator that basically shepherded like some students from Hallam University who were coming out of the film and media course who were interested in staying in Sheffield, like after they graduated and foreign production companies, you know, forming businesses here, that they moved into the workstation, had a little incubator space up there with like, you know, like a, almost like a hot desk, share an office, you know, kind of situation. And I think that they were like, yeah, I think it was called something like the the business incubator space for a little while. Now, I don't know if that exists still. Um, and if it does, I'm not aware of it, you know? So if, if that's the kind of thing that maybe we could see enhance or, or become, you know, uh, something that happens with more universities or colleges across the region, I think it worked really well. I, I could think of one production company that I have since worked with. As a matter of fact, I was with a, um, I was with them on Saturday night. We had a screening of a film that I helped uh, get developed, get produced um, early, no, last year and into this year too. And they stayed in Sheffield and, and you know, were part of that incubator scheme and managed to, you know, create a successful business here in Sheffield. Um, so, you know, I'd like to see that kind of thing happen a little bit more and, and maybe, you know, see, see, it, see it happen across um, more universities if that exists. I don't, I'm not aware of anything like that if it does. No, I think it's one of the one of the initiatives that didn't uh, emerge post COVID, sadly. Uh, but it doesn't mean to say it can't be reinvented. Yeah. Uh, but the intention was to try and find uh, pathways for uh, people coming out of higher education into into industry, uh, trying to find them placements on any film productions that were taking place. Um, I mean, when we're making uh, short films, we try and find. Uh, slots for for people coming out of film production courses to, to join the production team, for example. Um, and we have been working with uh, universities locally to try and uh, find placements in companies in our building, uh, which might hopefully improve their uh, employability. So you know that there's a, a number of small scale initiatives taking place. It will be much sort of. Uh, it would be helpful if that was sort of slightly more structured and, and funded. So at the moment it, it's uh, it's not funded. So we're just doing that to try and uh, take advantage of opportunities where we can. Um, but, but yeah, there, there's nothing. Uh, there's no funded structure at the moment that I'm aware of. So I, I think in one of your slides, Ian, you mentioned about these the network being established um, in relation to the part it plays in the regional economy and recognizing the impact that uh, boosting the sector would have. Is that something that part of the um, thinking has been around trying to evaluate what that's, that financial, that economic impact of the, 
of the sector might be as a result of either network activities or just working across the sector to try and sort of get that information together to take forward further funding bids or regional development? Yeah, um, I think it's, it's increasingly, uh, I think people are increasingly aware of the economic value of the cultural activity in South Yorkshire and that um, it is contributing a huge amount to the region where it's not necessarily been one of the areas that have been sort of uh, at the forefront of, of sort of policy making for, for the region. But I think certainly under the, the current mayor that that realisation that, that the creative industries is, a, is a, of huge economic value to our region uh, is, is becoming clearer and clearer. And, you know, I, I very much hope that we've contributed to sort of to that thinking and to making people aware of some of the, uh, some of the things that are taking place in South Yorkshire. Um, but yeah. Uh, Thanks. That's, very valuable if uh, that's how. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We've had a couple more questions um, in the chat uh, from Lee from Lee Hall. Have you seen challenges post COVID in terms of engagement with events? Uh, what has worked well or not so well? Um, I think at first there was a little bit of hesitation coming out, um, you know, in terms of like being comfortable being around each other again and stuff. There was, um, I guess my best example is um, this music video competition I mentioned that I've done. We've done it 10 times in, in about the 15 years since the thing was actually like in, in, invented, um, two weeks to make it. And I was all set to go, you know, with funding and dates and, you know, to an extent venues and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, at the like sort of, 2019 that was all set up to launch in 2020 and then COVID hit and I had to put everything aside and I've, I've only now like bat managed to get everything back together again to possibly I think we're going to be launching it in the autumn or or um you know winter of 2024 like early 2024 and that's uh you know that's a long time to have this the, that, that long to put it back together again and get all the partners involved and you know get these kinds of things going again it really took a, a, a while so yeah, that was certainly a challenge. And that was, I guess, mostly because of the money. You know, the money was in place, but when it fell apart, it took that long to try to get it back together again um, after COVID, yes. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Ian? Yeah, so it, it's been quite noticeable post COVID that it's taking quite a long time for events to recover to the, the level they were uh, before the pandemic. Um, and that process is still taking place. Um, I mean, I said we, we're just at the end of this year's DocFest, uh, which is, I think the figures were announced this morning that uh, attendance has grown by 17%, but that's still less than it was um, in 2019. And, you know, it, it, and I think a lot of events of that nature are, are experiencing the same thing. Um, people are coming back, but they're coming back slowly and cautiously, and that's still happening. Um, we found that immediately after the lockdown, um, pretty much young people came back straight away. Older people took a long, long time, and they're still uh, starting to to still returning, um, and they haven't returned in in the numbers that that we had before. Um, unique events do really well when there's a, a speaker or something that is a one-off. They tend to do really well, but. Um, a lot of events when it's perhaps not as unique, where it's just you know, meeting people and talking, is not really as well attended as it used to be. So we're trying to find ways through to this new landscape, find new ways of engaging people. And I think a lot, a lot of events are the same. It, it's uh, it's it's slow, steady progress, but but it is slow and steady. Um, yeah, I think, there's no I think... easy answer. I don't think. I think there's also an element to say that, like, if there if there's a possibility for people to attend something online, and some people might, you know, opt for the online option, for say if someone was coming to Docfest and weren't, you know, coming for the networking or coming for the, you know, face to face stuff, they were just coming to watch the films. Well, there's the Doc Player online. They might just log into that, buy a pass to do that, and and do it that way. And that, you know, I'm not sure if that's included in the numbers that Ian just shared before. You know, those people are just going online. Maybe they're not, you know, they're not included in that in terms of attendance. And that affects our, 
you know, that affects the numbers in terms of people that actually come to the doors. Mm -hmm. That option, you know, that option didn't really exist as robustly before COVID, mm -hmm. you know, so now it's like, oh, this is something I want to do now. I'm used to, you know, just like this today, right now. I think 70% is a good figure, I hope then, for this year round in terms of on the right trajectory. No, we're yeah. pleased with it, don't get yes. me wrong. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, another question from uh, Lee in, in, the, uh, in the chat. So Lee says, we're expecting at least one major film and HETV studio development in Sunderland with 20 sound stages. What's your advice to HE and industry in preparing for this opportunity? One major film and HETV studio development. Um, <laughs> get involved early <laughs> i'd say like get to know them as as early as you can and find out you know when's when's it going to happen what are the dates is there scope for like you know student placements or training you know that kind of thing if you know because the sooner that that kind of thing is planned and the sooner you're a part of it and part of the machine or part of like you know crewing up or something like that if that's what you're interested in really does depend on how you want to involve and engage with, with the film with the with the actual project, you know, the sooner you're involved with it, the, the earlier you get involved and you're part of the plan, the better rather than trying to get involved last minute. Um, yeah, I guess that's a small criticism of some things I have seen before from universities to colleges. If, if like, if money gets released last minute, they try to kind of quickly get involved with something. And sometimes, you you know, you don't engage as, as, as well as you could have if you got involved early. That's sound life advice across the board there. I think they were up, so that's, uh, but yeah, I think that's from the university perspective as well, that that's absolutely the right thing to do in terms of forward planning around things. So that's really helpful. Well, maybe, yeah, well, I would say, yes, absolutely. Make sure that there's opportunities for, for local people to, to get involved and that, you know, make sure that people have been trained in the right way to provide the right skills to, to work in that sector, because it'd be very easy to, to get people to move in, make the film and go away again, as, as we know has happened in a lot of places. So yeah, absolutely, you develop, develop the skill sector. Yeah, I mean, from a, production, from a producer's point of view, if I look at it as a filmmaker, like a producer, like, you know, I, I, I like to try to crew my films up as early as I can, you know, and I like to try to like, just forget about that. Those guys are booked now, those people are booked now. Great, I can get on with all the other stuff, artistic direction, props, you know, equipment, stuff like that, you know, directing actors. And if I know my crew is sort of early, I don't really want to revisit it again later, you know? So if this is happening, um, if that's the kind of thing that Lee's like sort of referring to, I hope it is, then then great, you know, start engaging with that in a crew perspective, like, you know, as early as you can, so the producers can do the same thing. Oh, forget about it. We've got 20 students now doing this, you know? And then you know that, you know, they, that, that those roles are filled. Okay, that's great, thank you. I think we just got one last question then, um, which will probably bring us to a close. Um, and again, so relates to something Lee said in the uh, in the Q and A. Um, if you could give us an idea of what successful collaboration between higher education institutions, between universities, um, and your networks or or industries uh, look like. Um, so, from your point of view, can you kind of sum up in a few words what successful collaboration looks like? Um, so what does it look like? Looks like money. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> looks, like in, looks like invoices. No, it looks like uh, numbers, I think. I think that if you have a successful collaboration between universities and, and um, well, like just HE and, and network, it's something that pervades over time. It's not like, you know, just over when the project's over. You know, it's something that like that, that when students are involved or staff members are involved, it's something that's like almost renewable, you know, because there's a constant stream of students. It doesn't mean that when one, of, one set of them graduate, the program should be over if it was successful. You know, it's about renewing. It's about keeping that relationship going. It's like it's a growing that relationship, seeing it expand over time, uh, you know, rather than just seeing it evaporate. If a let's say a tutor uh, retires that was spearheading it or, you know, um, you know, that, that, that cohort of students graduates. If it was working, there's no reason to see it like not continue. So it's, it's about that continued engagement and communication between the HE institution and the network to see it keep developing over time and not just, and not just evaporate. Okay, thanks Rob. Ian? Um, I, think, I think for me, it, it, what I'd like to see is, is um, I suppose, a set of placements coming out of it that 
would be opportunities for people to, to work in industry to, to find, find jobs that would lead to, to permanent employment. I think if that, if that could be established, that would be a, a really useful outcome. In terms of how you achieve that, um, I think it's, it's through more engagement with, with events, that all sorts of events, not just the ones we're doing, but all sorts of events that link the academic institutions to industry and find ways to, to kind of keep that, uh, that dialogue open and, and ongoing. If I could just ask the second part of that final question then, if I may. In, in terms of equity of access for students, I think we talked about this briefly earlier, Rob. Um, not all students having the same type of access. You picked it up in your presentation, I think, when you were talking about not wanting to advantage or disadvantage some students who've been able to engage how can you make that a sort of equal access to networks for students from different backgrounds, students in different positions? Are there things that can be done to make access to the networks uh, sort of, you know, to equal and, and open to all? It's to me. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Rob. Sorry. Yeah. When we were talking earlier, I think you'd been talking about some students were able to access the network and some students had not necessarily been able to. Sorry, it's probably been a very long week with DocFest. And that's uh, one, one last thing to throw at you towards the end. But I think it was sort of that, it, you know, engagement and access for students and, and making that as, uh, as open as possible. And, and is there more that can be done either from the HE side of things to open up that access or, or things that you think from your experience would enable students from perhaps yeah. disadvantaged backgrounds to be able to access things on an equal basis. Yeah, I think marketing is the key. You know, I was kind of talking about a little bit before. I think that sometimes the, the, the marketing aspect is like, you know, it's, maybe it's a little bit too silo or it's a little bit like, you know, so not spread around the university or the college enough, you know, so like spread that out there. Don't make it, you know, too like feel like it's too private or something. And I think that like sometimes like just the very sort of the process of making that feel really palatable and attractive, palatable and attractive to students and young people and have like one of the tutors come along too, you know, that kind of thing. So like leading people to the events, making it kind of like shared across different platforms at the university, whether it's on social media or WhatsApp groups or whatever, you know, that kind of thing to really see that spread out there. I think that was part of the problem uh, with maybe that mental health and film and TV thing I mentioned before, it was like there were more people that found out about it later after the program was over. And they're like, oh, I wish I knew about this. I have, you know, issues with anxiety. I have issues with, you know, something. And I would have loved to have known about this, you know, to help navigate my way through those anxiety issues and, you know, and, and not be, you know, intimidated enough to not you know, go for a role on a film, you know? So I think that's what it's all about, to get that word out there, Mark. Um, there's um, something that actually I would like to mention also that Lee uh, mentioned in an earlier question. Lee, you've got all the questions today, man. <laughs> and that was the, uh, uh, what the experience was of working with multiple HE providers, like if things happen all at once. And I haven't really done that, but I did want to, like I haven't ever worked with, let's say lots of different HE institutions on one program at the same time, but, I wanted to mention that um, Screen Yorkshire have got something called a Connected Campus, which is a which is a program that I think Lee, you said that you might be um, you might be developing something like that with Northeast Screen at the moment. Now, Connected Campus, I'm about to go to an event in early July where we're going to talk about uh, my music video competition that can be open to all the different universities that are, and, and colleges that are involved with uh, Connected Campus. And that's really about the facilitation of engagement with film and television, you know, from the university sector and Screen Yorkshire are a bit of a conduit to do that. I think right now there's 21 different institutions involved with Connected Campus. So I would, I would say to people if like want to know more about something like that and how but like multiple organizations can engage, um, you know, with something like that, check out Connected Campus on the Screen Yorkshire website. I can put it into the chat, I'm not sure. Um, Screen Yorkshire code at UK. And check out Connect the Campus because it's, it's it's an example of that of that very thing that Lee's asking about. Thanks, Rob. Ian, any well, yeah, I mean one thing to, to sort of try and break down barriers is to try and make them free if you can, because yeah, yeah. Uh, economic barriers are quite quite 
problematic at the moment. But also, I think probably more importantly, to try and uh, engage with the communities you're, you're hoping to, to attract people from. Um, you know, if you can involve young people in, in the planning and the promotion, that, that helps. Um, I mean, we recently worked with um, on a different project with uh, the Somali community in Sheffield. And, uh, you know, we worked very closely with the Somali community organization who were then, then able to spread the word and we got really good attendance for our event. But, you know, it's not something that I could I could do. I wouldn't even attempt it, but, but by working with the Somali community, we were able to sort of achieve quite a lot. Um, so as a, as a way of moving things forward, I would say it's a general principle. You know, you, you want to attract young people, work with young people. Yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you, Ian. And uh, I think that just about brings us to a close on the questions. So um, my colleagues will be dropping hopefully a couple of things into the chat, just where we can find where you can find out more information about the Civic University Network on our website. Um, if you are not subscribed to our newsletter, please do and you'll get notification of when the recording of this event and our upcoming program are out there. Our next event is um, at the University of Exeter are talking about a university student led tutoring project that they have on, which is, uh, we're putting it out on the 28th of June. Uh, but it really just remains for me to really thank Ian and Rob um, for fantastic overviews of your networks and a really engaging discussion, uh, particularly in this really busy time with DocFest. I absolutely appreciate your, your time. Um, I think there's been some great rich things for us to take away today. So thank you ever so much for, uh, for, for your time and for your presentations today. And thank you everyone who was able to to join us. We'll close there then. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Take care now. Thanks.